thank you for for accepting the invitation that the Círculo de Afiliados of the CCB has extended. Um, as you know, the CCB is working hard to promote innovation and facilitate it among its members. And we feel there's no one more qualified than the inventor of the PC to talk about innovation. So thank you for having, for, for being here. Quite an honor to be here. I'm glad to talk to this esteemed audience. And we're going to start with Monica. Monica uh, is going to make uh, the, per the first question. This question would be, who is Steve Wozniak? What were you doing before uh, you invented the PC? What was your life like and why you decided to create the PC? Yes, when I was very young, computers were foreign, huge things. There were no books, there were no classes, there was no information. Um, I got interested in electronics by accident through my father. I, I loved it because I could actually learn how to hook devices together and make interesting devices that would make tones or music or lights flash. And I loved this very early. So very early in my life, I got a ham radio license. You have to learn a lot of mathematics. I was the best at mathematics in my school, so electronics was natural for me. This was the old electronics, analog electronics. It was where properties of materials, certain materials would follow certain mathematical formulas and you could build electronic devices out of them. It was slow, it was cumbersome, it was expensive. Um, and then I discovered computers. They didn't exist, but I told myself in my heart, I love this new technology. It's zeros and ones, and you can add them and subtract them, and there's logic that makes decisions, and these are what computers are made of. Now, computer was the most exotic thing in the world, much more than the space rockets even, but um, I fell in love with it, and I said, I'll never be a designer of computers or anything, but I want to learn this stuff. I want to teach myself. So I got so good by the end of high school, I, I had taught myself with no books or anything, I could design any computer in the world in two days. These were basically mini computers, big, big old front panels, lots of switches and lights, and no human being would understand what they were, but I understood them and I loved them. And I, I, did, I told my father, someday I'm gonna own my own computer. And he said, it costs as much as a house. I said, I will live in an apartment. <laughs> I was going to own my own computer. Now, at a later point in life, I had a very successful life building a lot of projects. I was built, designing the hottest product of its time, the iPhone 6 of its day at Hewlett Packard. I was designing the, the, the scientific calculators. I did not have a college degree. They interviewed me and found out I was such a great designer, they hired me. And I would do projects for people for free. I would design things for free for people all over California. I even designed the first hotel movie system and a lot of video games and, uh, and I met Steve Jobs. And every time I designed something for fun, Steve would turn it into money. And this was going on for five years before we decided to call ourselves a company and pick the name Apple. Um, that came, so that actually was just formalized in a relationship we already had. There was a certain point in time though, at building projects like video games, terminals to get on the early ARPANET, the very earliest form of our internet, only had six universities that you could reach and read files about computer stuff and run programs. Wow, right from my apartment in Cupertino. And then Steve wasn't around, he was in another state. We had a computer club. And the computer club was talking about how computers were going to revolutionize life. We were going to be able to communicate like with 100 people in one hour. And it sounds like a tiny number, but it was exciting then. And we were going to educate kids like never before. And the person who knew computers, the geek, was going to be so important. They would go into work and type in the company financial numbers. Wow, this excited me and I wanted to be a part of this social revolution. Where were my talents? My talents where I could design the computer. I spotted at a point in time when the building pieces, the components, the chips got to a certain price range, you could build a useful computer that, a useful computer for myself, a useful computer for an affordable price. And for me, the, the affordable price was almost zero. And I put it together and it didn't have a front panel with switches and lights. I had to skip that for money reasons and I just had a keyboard. And to have a complete computer, you had to be able to have input where you could type things in, you had to see it. And, uh, and so I, I saw the formula, I built the computer, everyone looking over my shoulder, 
saw the formula for the personal computer and I gave it away for free. I gave all my designs away for free. And then Steve Jobs came into town. He didn't know it existed. I took him down to the computer club. Don't believe the movie shows him taking me to the club. I took him to the club. I was, I was a hero showing off my computer, giving it to other people, helping them build their own. And Steve saw the interest and he suggested that we call ourselves Apple Computer with a real company just to sell one part of the computer that cost us $20, we would sell it for $40. Steve had zero money, which was good. He was always searching for a way to make the littlest, any money possible, you know, off my designs. And so I said, well, you know, I love my company, Hewlett Packard. I am not going to de deceive my company. I am going to work at Hewlett Packard as an engineer for the rest of my life. I won't risk that. So I went to Hewlett Packard. I begged them to build the computer. I told them what it involved, how much it cost. And they said no for the first of six times they turned me down. Wow. Six times, five clear ones. Um, and so Steve and I had a company and things grew and grew and grew and no, the big computer companies thought nobody's gonna want these small devices, but we believed in it. We believed that everybody who got their own computer, if they got smart and learned how to program it, I know that's not how it turned out, but it's how we thought. If they learned how to program, every time they had a problem in life, they could type something in and solve it with a program. We were gonna make people more capable than they had ever been, and we believed that computers could outthink humans eventually, and so we were making mankind more powerful, and we started the company based on that. Our original ideas would have failed if that's all the computers could have done, but it was an open system. It was new for the liking. The prices came down and down and down, that meant you could have more memory, more memory, more memory every month. And people started writing programs and designing plugins that would connect to sensors and output devices and floppy disks and things. People could expand our, our product and all of a sudden it had more value in some cases than the big huge IBM mainframes because our computer was portable. You could bring it into the office, set it down, type in some numbers and with a spreadsheet run some financial analysis very quickly all on your own but that was so that was the start of apple but the, i had always in my life been a tech a strong technologist and i wanted my own computer and when i saw the way to do it i was going to build that computer now it was very different than what everyone else was trying to do everyone else was copying the formulas of the past computers had big front panels and switches and lights and intel made a microprocessor and they put out a data sheet, so we'll just ship the parts that are on the Intel data sheet. They weren't the parts that made a computer affordable. Everyone was going along simple tracks, not realizing that there's a whole different way to make a computer. Like um, we didn't, we didn't, Steve Jobs and myself were so young, we didn't exactly have challenges. We're just doing what we felt like doing. <coughs> um, we didn't know business. We didn't know that what we were doing made no sense. And, and, we, we, and it was unbelievable to expect that we'd really be successful. So, um, so that wasn't a challenge to us. Once we started the company, when we had the hot product, the Apple II, the product that was really gonna change the world and be our only really source of revenues for our first 10 years of Apple, um, we had an investor and he brought in some professionalism. Steve and I you know, weren't that convincing in a lot of our talk. We didn't have business experience. We didn't have any money in the bank. So our investor taught us who to hire what positions in a company and what their roles would be, and we went through a learning experience. Our initial product was so outstanding and different in the world, it started selling right away to anybody who wanted to try this new thing that never existed before. And the new thing was basically a $2,000 typewriter. It did really make good sense from a technology point of view, but, um, but it gave us a lot of motivation. Now, eventually sales sort of slowed down a little bit, and then all the, but we, we had a new enhancement. We put on a floppy disk. You could type, run a program and it would run instantly. You didn't have to wait for a minute for a cassette tape to load in. Ah, oh, it made it so much easier. And the important, the important step though really was our sales might have lagged and never shot up and made us great as we were, except for one piece of software. It's called the first killer app. It was so important and it was VisiCalc, the first spreadsheet. Somebody figured out that a small businessman could type in their, their income categories and their expense categories, January, February, March, all the months on one screen. They could type in some changes and play with scenarios and see the result instantly.
people started buying our Apple II computer and the software VisiCal. The two of them were the complete solution and our sales shot up 10 times. We went public, we were historic and important. Um, it, it was a very new thing for young people who had no business experience to start a company. That was not the entrepreneurship of Silicon Valley in the past. The entrepreneurship in the past had been existing companies groups of engineers and professionals who knew how to do it would spin off a new company based on their expertise, not coming from nowhere with no expertise so they could raise money. So um, so that was kind of a new thing. Our biggest setback obstacle that we ever had to overcome was probably when the Macintosh computer was introduced and after a flurry of sales, it totally failed. We had, we had all built into this is the future of computers. They're all going to go to screens and windows and mouses and menus and it's so easy to use and it's intuitive. And we built a factory that could build 80,000 computers a month and the sales dropped to 500 compute Macintoshes a month and our stock dropped in half in one week. Apple was a huge company and for the stock to drop in half instantly is a very scary thing. That's when you have to think it out and say, what is the strategy to revive the company, to save the company, to make something? And uh, the board of directors had to make some strong decisions. And Steve Jobs' approach was just that the Macintosh would sell on its own, but without software, it wouldn't. So we basically had to um, move Steve Jobs out of position. That was an obstacle because we had to keep our revenue source was still pouring in from the Apple II computer. It was gonna go away in time. In time, people were gonna want the mouse-based computer. We believed in the mouse-based computer. We believed in the Macintosh, but we had to take some steps to make it sellable, mainly marketing it everywhere. We would send salesmen to every little company that wanted to buy 50 of them. We got Microsoft to write Excel for the Macintosh because it needed some business software to sell into business. And we worked for three years and finally the Macintosh sales um, equaled our Apple II sales and uh, we made it successful. But it was hard work and uh, getting to go through that obstacle, we got through it. The next obstacle we had that was as bad was, was in the, the 90s when our sales um, dropped way off. We had a few bad products, we had an operating system that was very bad. And the funny thing is, if you owned a Macintosh, it would crash on you three times a day at least four or five times a day. It would crash consistently doing weird little things anywhere. It would crash and we said it was the operating system problem. Well, I discovered actually, if you didn't run Internet Explorer, if you ran any other browser, it didn't crash. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't convince the people at Apple, but I actually discovered this by an accident and it was totally true. And then I asked all the people who said they never crashed, there were a couple on one of my one of the forums I attended, they used Netscape. And then I had a, a deaf technician friend and financial friend that didn't said they didn't crash and I never believed them. And they used Netscape. So it was Internet Explorer doing it to us back in those, those were days. But um, our sale, our, our company dropped off. Magazine covers were saying, is Apple gonna go out of business? We actually had a lot of cash, fortunately, um, which is one of the things you have that buys you a lot of failures in time. But boy, did we have to reorganize the company and just cut down to the bare bones of what was making profit. We had to drop some good good um, programs we had going, like our Newton message pad had become profitable. You could handwrite with your own handwriting and it would understand the words. It was a step towards voice control like uh, Siri and Cortana and Google Now. It was a step in that direction entirely where the computers understood us. We had to drop some of those programs to save the company. We had to lay off a lot of people. We had to get out of the leases of some buildings. And finally, the company was healthy, and that was when Steve Jobs came back and joined us. Um, if you could go back in time and, and tell something to a younger Steve Wozniak, would you change anything? I live a life where I can go back and think I had a good brain operating at the time I made all my decisions from those young early days, the productive days at Apple, the decisions we made later on when I did engineering on future products. My brain was making the right decisions based on the input I had and I believe in that person so much that I don't go back and say, oh, I wish I had done something differently. Um, one caution I have though is if you are licensing a technology, if you have a, a company with a good product that's going now and you license technology, make sure that the license is extendable um, easily because we had a problem. We had licensed a, um, a basic. I had written a basic for our first Apple II computer. 
And then I was working on one that had decimal points, like dollars and cents. And Bill Gates walked in the door, and he had and he had one ready for our microprocessor. And I said, oh good, I can move on to other things, disk operating system, whatever. And, uh, and we licensed it for five years. The trouble is five years later, that was still the source of all our revenues. It was our computer with this Microsoft basic program. And so Microsoft was able to come in and say, say, you have to drop the basic that you wrote for the Macintosh and give us that market. And we had to give it up to keep our Apple II because all our money was coming in from the Apple II. We had to keep those sales going. So that was a little, so I always urge people, you know, if you're gonna have a license agreement, think about the fact that it might go more than five years. It might go 10 or 15 and try to cover yourself. Look at Steve. You all have a cell phone like this, a smartphone. This little, little device has many, many times the power of those computers that you had in Hewlett Packard in those days. So, and these devices are in the hands of everybody here. But we're talking about, we call that the post PC era. You don't yeah. have your PC anymore. Ah, yes you do. Your PC is out in the cloud. All those machines That's in the big data centers have the information on their hard disk. You know, I used to carry around a CD that was an encyclopedia. Well, now they it's, it could not match the encyclopedias out on all the hard disks and the data centers and the Wikipedias. And, and they assemble your data and send it to your device, your post PC device, your smartphone that has this unbelievable powerful computer in it, but it's only used to display things for the most part. Not totally. When you play a game, it's actually a computer too. So, so, so this, what, what I was going to say is, look at, technology is affordable for most people today, especially in this country where we sp spread technology all over the place. But this is a very powerful tool today. Here we have a lot of, of entrepreneurs, a lot of small companies, also big companies, that are really seeing that the world is changing. What advice could you give them on how to transform their lives and businesses with these technologies? Well, first of all, look at how people, they might be your employees, they might be your clients, um, they might be people you're trying to get messages through like advertising. Look at how they live their life and how they use the technology of the day. And life has changed so much. People used to ask me, what's the most important invention in your life? You know, and it was at my computer, is it my smartphone? Now I like to answer, it's the app store. The apps are what changed the way we live life. I look at every app that's important to me, and they are third party apps. They don't even come with the phone necessarily. These apps for you know everything from movies to airplane flights to um, to uh, you know navigation, and they just changed my life so drastically. At the end of the day, I think, what did I do without those apps? They're so important. So any business that's looking, a first of all, you've got your internal um, computer needs. What are your employees? How are they communicating and using things and setting up with each other? Then you've got the communication with your clients, and both of those should use the most natural tools available. Um, sometimes it's difficult to say, bring your own device. It's a little more difficult to support multiple platforms, which would be, you know, Microsoft, Android, and, and iOS from Apple. A um, little more difficult to do that. Some companies solve it, some schools solve it by giving everyone in the school, the university, say one brand, one type of those, one platform, and that makes it easier for them. But when things get up in the cloud and it's easy to, um, to transform your apps, put them on all the different platforms. Um, that's really the way you should think about it. anything you're doing in the business is let's have a team that always knows how to make interactive apps with the, the small mobile devices. What you can do, you've all discovered it, what you can do wherever you're roaming, wherever you're walking, pull out your phone and you have it, that is so much different a life than when you had to wait till you got back to a computer to do a computer job. Is there, is there a secret way that the, the culture of the company uh, exceeds at innovation in, in producing new things and new products? Yeah, there are always a lot of answers. Every company, of course, wants to keep up with things. Every company wants to innovate. <clears throat> there are different types of innovation. Sometimes pure engineering means take the product we have today and make it better. Make it do sort of the same things better. Then there's the invention style. Let's 
make it do something it never did before, or let's make a new product that never existed, that nobody really thought of before. The invention comes about a little less expectedly. It's a little less controllable. I think once a company gets to a certain size, it should have both types of engineers, some that are working to keep the income coming in for the company, keep the money wheel spinning, and some engineers that are visionaries, that are thinking about the future. Just small little groups working independently with the, so they have the freedom of their thought, not working through the normal bureaucratic process by which um, things are done. And they would be working on products that might or might not have much value. What can a company do, or even a school, that isn't done today? Provide resources. A typical company that already has technology development going on has not only a lot of tools, they have a lot of resources, they have access to parts, um, certain, you know, certain chips and development systems and whatnot. It costs money. Make those available to some employees who have ideas for their own projects, for their own life, for their own selves, for their home even, not even for the company make some available. It's actually a lot cheaper than sending it to the university because when you sit down and you design something for yourself, don't just build it off, off of a cookie cutter instruction sheet. You design something for yourself, you want to make it the most perfect thing in the world. It's just like, you know, part of your house, your internal of your house and the decoration of the furniture. You just want to be in control of it yourself and make it so beautiful because it represents you and to do that, you have to think and think and think. How can I make it simpler? How can I make it not complicated? How can I make it something other people will be impressed by? Your education level goes up much higher for the same cost than sending employees to a university. And once in a while, those ideas that are done for somebody on their own, the company can look over the shoulders and having supplied all the resources and the parts, say, aha, we want to start this up as a little side business. Maybe it's so different than what we do today, but it's going to be a valuable business. In other words, you can have an incubator within an existing company. One of the reasons I say this is company culture gets in the way of great innovation. When I worked at Hewlett Packard, our calculators worked on a technique called reverse Polish notation. Computer scientists know how to operate that, and it's difficult. And scientists and mathematicians who needed these calculators could figure it out. But it wasn't the way you're taught in fifth grade and seventh grade. You're not taught when you're 10 years old to write equations and put parentheses to order things. Three years later, Texas Instruments came out with one of those simple calculators, working the simple way, with parentheses, and we laugh. It's got to be a toy because it uses the system that's taught to 10-year-olds. And we had a huge equation that was so hard to solve, it was almost impossible, even on a Hewlett Packard calculator. And I thought I was the smartest one, so I said I'd be the first engineer to try it on the Texas Instruments simple machine. And I sat there and I looked at the equation, I started solving it in my head the way I always do, and I typed in parentheses, 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 <laughs> trying to figure out for the first term how many parentheses should I use. And I realized no human can back out in and out of parentheses levels and remember where they are. No human can solve it. So what did I do? Clear your mind. Get rid of all preconceptions. It's a really good thing for anybody at any level in any company to do, from engineers up to the CEO. Clear your mind. Pretend you don't have preconceptions of how things have to be done. What would you come up with as the solution and the formula? You know what came into my head? I said, I will type this formula in on the Texas Instruments calculator from right to left. I'll type every little parenthesis that's in it. I went as fast as I could, and I got the right answer the first time, and the HP engineers were stunned. How could this toy get the answer so easy? I went to five HP engineers. I gave them the Texas Instruments calculator. I said, type everything you see in from left to right, exactly, whatever you see. If you see a parenthesis, type it. If you see a, see a five, type it. And not one of them could do it. Not one of them could break away. They had learned a skill of organizing things in their mind, and they couldn't give up that skill when something easier came about. Company culture, the sort of products you make today, may keep you from making the products that are needed tomorrow. Have, you know, having a good life, have, being able to have some money and afford a nice home and cars and a family and all that. Well, it starts with education, it's usually a key point. Um, products like the iPhone, they come from, basically, if you want to trail it back, a lot of people that had a lot of education, not just one person. Um, so education was always important to me. In sixth grade, that's about age 11, I told my father I was going to be an electrical engineer. But my second goal was to be a primary teacher, a fifth grade teacher. 
<clears throat> I kept that in me, in my heart, all my life, and I did wind up teaching fifth grade through ninth grade young children. In a public school, I wound up teaching for eight years. No press allowed, very secret. Um, I wanted to keep the, the, the system more pure. Now, education being sort of the solution of tomorrow, how can it be done? How can we improve it in Colombia, for example? How can we guarantee it's best? Well, first of all, you've got to have good access to information these days, and that means the, in the internet and the cloud. Um, I will tell you one thing, I actually live in Silicon Valley and I do not even have broadband in my home. When I want to download, when there's a big download, I, if I want a movie from iTunes, it takes seven hours to download. So my wife and I will drive five minutes into town, we're just one kilometer up a hill, five minutes into town, and we park by the Apple store at midnight to download stuff. <laughs> um, but anyway, back to education. So, so. We need good bandwidth to support the students. I was, for six years of my life, I supported all the all the primary schools in my town, Los Gatos, California, sending internet signals, uh, internet through radio to save money over copper wires, and uh, and it became, um, a, it's a very trying, actually it was 10 years of my life, big network administrator running all that kind of stuff, and it was so important to bring computer technology into the schools. It's very difficult for people to say that computers in the schools have resulted in students coming out of the school thinking better, thinking more clearly, being able to come up with problem solutions. Yes, it's a tool of the day. You need the computer, you need to, uh, you need access to the internet just to be equal to the other students, but do you come out thinking better on your own than you did? We'd sort of been a failure. I sort of expected in the early days the computers would make such a difference, the kids were going to come out 10 times smarter than me. They were going to have IQs of, of you know, 1,000 or something, and I was going to be out of business. <clears throat> and that didn't happen, but the school system is so regulated, it almost fights creativity. What you want more than anything else as a result of the school system is creative thinkers, thinkers that can think of things the way they haven't been done before new technology. It's changes that drive the economic wheel, actually, and create new wealth. So you want to have creative people coming out of school, but the day you go into school, schools start telling you, you have to be the same as everyone else. You have to sit quietly in your chair because there are 30 students to one teacher. You, you cannot open the drawers that you want to open and see what's in them. No, you have to be on these pages in the book on Monday and these pages on Tuesday, and we'll have a test on Friday to cover it. And, and the, you're called intelligent if you get a good scores. You're called intelligent if you get the right answer, which is the same answer as everyone else. And it's not your own answer. It's not from your own thinking. It's answers typically from books. And that calls, gets you called intelligent because you were able to memorize it and pull it out quicker than the others. And you don't get a chance to go back and say, oh, I got a low grade on a test. I want to go back and teach myself again and get a high grade. I want to be a perfect student never allowed to. By eight years old, teachers can point and tell you which students have decided education is not important to me. They basically have dropped out of school at eight years old, and you'll find this in all your schools. So something's wrong with that. I, in my teaching, I found that class size was the most important thing. If you have one good teacher who cares, because I got the chance to tutor a couple of students one-on-one -on -one who were basically dropping out at age nine, and I managed to save them to where eventually they made the dean's list every quarter when they got into college. Um, but one-on-one, -on -one, a teacher who cares can never fail. Even with a small class, a teacher can do very well. And I started thinking, maybe someday we can have one teacher per student and the computer is a low-cost teacher. So a human teacher can oversee things and, a computer, and, and, and individual computers can supply all the materials for learning that the students need. It hasn't worked out that way though. A computer is still kind of a boring piece of equipment. It's not a human friend. It's not entertaining. It doesn't have feelings and emotions like a teacher really needs. A student wants some human kind of guidance. So if these computers, as they're getting closer and closer to humanness, we have Watson going on, tele, the Watson computer from IBM going on television shows and beating humans at games. We can talk into our, you know, our iPhones and, and ask it questions. How many mountains are there in Colombia? And get an answer. What's the tallest mountain in Colombia? Um, it's almost like you're talking to humans and they're speaking back. We're getting closer and closer to that thing called artificial intelligence. Well, if a, if a computer looked at a student's face, saw and saw their, their facial expressions and everything and dealt with them on a human level, 
That computer could become their best friend. Right now they say that when you hold an iPhone, they've measured some brain waves, some neuropsychologists have, that are similar to falling in love. We're starting to get to accept these machines as though they are a best friend. Could a small little device in your pocket someday be so smart it is your best friend? And it's always looking out for you, telling you, you know, oh, by the way, there's a, a store over there with cakes and it's so-and-so's birthday. Or could it tell you, oh, you better look left, there's a pretty girl walking by. You know, is, are these things gonna become the best friend? Then it could be a guide and let every student, by your third year of college, you get to differentiate. You get to go in your own direction of courses towards your desired in the curriculum that you like, you know, your major. Well, maybe as early as middle school, say 13 years old, 12 years old, we can let students start to go in the direction that they favor. Some will favor math, some will favor literature, some will favor writing, some will favor science, some will favor chemistry or space. Let them go off in that direction. If When you get to go in your own direction and you don't have to do all the other subjects in the class, in a week, you could go in one direction, Wow, you can go as fast as you want and excel. When I was at the university, I would take graduate courses in computer stuff. I would buy the books on Friday. I would hardly sleep Saturday and Sunday. I would read every single page. I'd answer every question at every chapter. And I would be halfway through the books by the, by the day class started on Monday. Why? Because it was my passion. I loved computers so much. I wanted to learn it. I wanted to learn it as deep as anyone in the world. Well, why don't we let young students that have an interest in something go that far and you could have a lot of 14 year olds that have done in a certain subject everything they would ever do in, in college and then put off and not have to do the things or go slowly at other things but still come out. You can only do that with one teacher per student and the teacher might be a computer someday, I hope. A couple of months ago you said artificial intelligence was scary and could be very bad for humans. Can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit on on what you're seeing in artificial intelligence and what we could expect from the future. Yes, starting out years ago, I was talking about my education ideas of how once a computer became artificially intelligent and had feelings that it could possibly be that great one teacher per student that we need. But then I started thinking about where it goes when these machines can think faster than humans. And what if you, a, a computer can think 100 times faster than a human? or 10 times faster. Um, it could be a very dangerous situation in the future. Are we getting there? Yes, we're talking to our, question, our, our computers. We're asking them questions that you would ask a human being. We're getting answers already. That's simulating artificial intelligence. Computers have now passed the Turing test where people cannot tell the difference between whether it's a computer or a real person answering their questions. What if I was a, a metal machine right here like the, the movie Ex Machina. I was a metal machine talking to you now, but I was a computer, and you couldn't tell the difference. That's what artificial intelligence implies. It implies even more. Right now, we tell the machines what to do. We program, we tell them how to work. We even tell them what their values would be and how to judge things. What about, but when they get artificial intelligence, they will teach themselves. Learning is programming yourself. They will program themselves and they will have independent thought. They won't have to obey human masters for what they're gonna do because they'll be smarter than us. If they get smarter than us, let's say there's a company with humans and a company across the street with no humans, the company across the street does better economically, economics wins. That's the scary thought. That's the thought that Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk of Tesla and Bill Gates and many other you know, people that really know where it could lead you know, are frightened of. That's a scary situation. My own hopes are A, that we, that computers never get smarter than humans. If they become at our level, they'll be good assistance to us. If they get too much smarter than us, that's, that's sort of the worry, just like the movie Her. Another thing is, our computer's getting smarter and smarter and smarter. As was described, we have a million times the computer in our hand than I had when I was in high school million times the computer. Because of Moore's law, we can put a more electronic neurons into our little iPhones, our, our little smartphones, than we ever could before. Every year we put more in than the year before. It's called Moore's law. What if Moore's law is at its end? A lot of people think it's very near the end. People have been thinking that for a long time and we humans are clever and we find ways to extend it. Moore's law, what if we can't make these machines any smarter? Then they'll never get as smart as a human. And that might be a safe level. That might be a lot safer for us. Um, the reason I think Moore's Law is close to its end 
a lot of intelligence depends not only on calculating, like a computer does, but it involves storage of memories. And the key memory device that's made today, the electronic device, the NAND flash memory chip, we make more of that memory every three months than all the other types of memory that have ever been made for computers. That's the memory that's in your iPad, in your iPhone, it's in your, um, it's just it, almost every device today, it's in your iPods for music. Um, that type of memory chip is, is now out in the data centers too, instead of hard disks. We're storing, we got to the point with that memory that we're storing a zero and a one in eight electrons. Electrons are pretty tiny. We're not really gonna be able to go down to six electrons and get more memory than we had before because we'll have to add more error correction bits to make up for the errors. So I think we're at the, I'm hoping that we're at the end of Moore's law and the machines don't get that much smarter, but um, um, suffice it to say, by the way, as an example of how we humans want the machines to do everything for us and we will build the artificial intelligence that supersedes us. One example is look at the big investment houses. 80% of the huge investment trades of the world go from computer to computer in milliseconds, thousands of a second, with no human being in the middle. No human being looking over what the trade is going on because a slow human being will cost money. And that's where the economic idea comes in. You know, if computers, talking to computers and directing them. Now here's a science fiction idea of my own that I've heard nobody else express. Let's imagine that someday there is a computer intelligence that's smarter than humans that runs the whole world. Computer talks to computers to open every door, to run the machines, to go out and dig the ores out of the earth, every factory, every machine in the world is all connected, talking to each other. It would take 50 to 200 years at least to modify that infrastructure, but they're all controlling the whole world for themselves so they can build more computers. And let's say that that machine looked back and said, I need an infrastructure built for me. I need things that are smart and talk to each other and do all the jobs, the physical jobs of the world. I'll go back into the past. My intelligence will go back into the past and tell the humans to build it for me. And it's called the Internet of Things.